Okay. Thank you, Jason. Um, this is going to be an audience participation presentation. I have some craft brews here. Picked them up at uh, the, the uh, craft brewery that's actually closest to where I live. It's called Manor Hill Brewing in Howard County. Have a couple kinds. One's a Pilsner, the other's a Grisette. There will be some questions embedded in this presentation and you'll have the opportunity to give me the answer to the question. And if you are of drinking age or older, you can win a beer. If you're not, IDs will be inspected. Uh, I can't give you the beer, I'll have to take it home. Or if you don't answer the questions, I get to take the beers home. So you can well imagine these are probably some loaded questions, right? So, yeah, all right. So we're gonna talk about malting body. You know, I've got all this stuff on me here. I feel like I'm gonna have to go into witness protection after I'm done giving this talk. I've got so many wires and things on me that uh, hopefully I don't get my hands entwined with everything. All right, malling barley, what is it? It's Homer Simpson's favorite grain. It's one way of describing it. Another way of describing it is it is the barley that undergoes a process that then allows it to be used to make beer. There are two row types, which are the preferred types. And there are six row types. Why are the two row types the preferred type? Well, here's a look at after the arms have been taken off of a two row and a six row and we're looking up, what's, what's the head, basically the backbone of the head called? This is not one of the questions. <laughs> rachis? Have you heard of rachis? R-A-C-H-I-S? Well, now you know. If you didn't learn anything else today, that you, you could go home, home with a little bit of trivia. Anyway, this backbone right here is called the rachis. There are nodes along the rachis where kernels are actually formed after you have pollination uh, occur. On this two row, and it's kind of like a step ladder, each rachis node has a kernel, just a single kernel at each node, which means those kernels get plumper. On a six row type, and let's take this two row and rotate it 90 degrees. If we do that, here are the primary kernels on a six row, which are basically these same primary kernels that you have on a two row. What happens with a six row though, you also get formation at that same rachis node of two secondary kernels. Those two secondary kernels are smaller. The reason the malting industry prefers the two row is because of the uniformity in size and they are plumper, which means there's more starch. And starch is important because in the malting process, you're changing the starch into, what are we changing it to? Sugar. Sugar. That's also not one of the questions. So. <laughs> we also have winter and spring varieties. Spring varieties uh, are really the most commonly grown in the U.S. If you go out into the Colorado, Wyoming, Dakota region, even into Minnesota, some of those areas, there's a lot of malting barley produced and it's produced primarily for the, the large beer companies, your Budweiser, your Miller, your Coors. So they desire very uniform uh, barley and they, it's almost all spring types that, that, that they will purchase. Okay. So let's look at this malting barley as kind of a new crop or an alternative crop for the region. And there's some things that have to occur in order for a new crop to be successful in any particular region. At least in my mind, there are things that have to occur. One of which is you've got to have the demand for the, the product or nobody's going to grow it, right? Second thing is you want an accessible delivery point for the crop, which is available in this region for malting barley. But if you have to ship the crop 500 or 1,000 miles, you're not likely to, to get involved in that. There's been a few instances of, of those types of crops that have come into the, the region before. And last, the crop must be adaptable to the region, meaning you gotta have the right climate for it. And we can grow barley here, there's no doubt about that. Has to fit the crop rotation. Barley fits into our rotations really well. And you gotta have, and this is probably the most important one of all, you have to have farmer acceptance. And farmers 
They want it to fit into their crop rotation, and typically they don't want to get involved in buying a lot of new equipment in order to produce the crop. They'd like to be able to do it with the equipment they have. They can do that with malting barley. They've got a combine, they've got a sprayer, they've got a planter. It's really all you need. All right, so let's look a little bit more closely at this demand in the Mid-Atlantic region. And what I'm talking about as far as Mid-Atlantic region is Delaware, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Maryland. What kind of beer demand do we have? What kind of beer drinkers are we? Well, we're, we're nothing great. I mean, the, the, the biggest consumption occurs in Delaware. About almost 28 gallons a year. There's 10, almost 11 beers, 12 ounce beers in a gallon. So Bel Delawareans are consuming about 306 beers a year. That's pretty damn good. On the other end of the scale, we got Maryland. We come in at the bottom. I think there's more wine drinkers over there. I, I don't know what they are, but uh, we're 48th. United States, average consumption, 282 beers a year, or it's about 26.4 gallons of beer a year. All right, question number one. Can you guess which state consumes the most beer? This is beer, not craft beer. This is beer in general. Wisconsin, Wisconsin no. Texas? Texas? Ah, big <laughs> state, but no. Nope. Colorado. No. Nope. Colorado's into other things now. They've, they've fallen <laughs> off. <laughs> Somebody's in New York? No. 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 I think I get a beer here. New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Can you believe it? When I saw that, I couldn't believe it. 433 beers a year. Must be those winners. I have no idea. All right. A little closer look at this demand and, and what has changed is this growth. And this is number of breweries. And it's a historical summary of the number of breweries we have going back into the 1800s, the late 1800s when there were a lot of them and then it fell off. And then for a good period of time, about 50 years, there, there really weren't too many at all. But then about 1990, 1995, the industry just kind of took off. Why? Oh, first Another question? Why no beer breweries here? I think I heard the answer already. You got it. You get a beer. Thank you. So at the end of the presentation, come on up and claim your beer. You, you, you're older than 21, so I think, uh, you, yeah, you'll be okay. You know, IDs will be required for anybody that looks a little on the young side. So anyway, okay. So what's happened? had this tremendous growth right here. What's happened? And this is from 1994, the types of breweries that are out there. And the growth is really occurring in microbreweries and brew pubs. And really, since about 2010, things really took off. Well, what's happening to the craft brewing industry? Kind of what's happening to the brewing industry across the country? Miller, Coors, Budweiser, They've got reason for concern. Their consumption is down. However, these craft brews are taking off. 5% increase last year, where it's now 12.7% of the beer consumption market is in craft brews. Another question, which Mid-Atlantic crop school, state, and five states I'm considering here, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, West Virginia. Which one is the leading state for craft brew consumption? Chance to win a beer. Pennsylvania. No. Delaware. Delaware. Who said Delaware? You win a beer. Delaware comes in first place. They rank second in the country. 12.6 gallons per year. I think a lot of it is because of Flying Dog is why they're at that, that point. All right, another question. What is the top ranked US state for craft brew consumption? Now we're talking craft brew consumption. Oregon, Washington, California. 
Somebody said something back here. Nope. <laughs> Close. Vermont. Vermont. Did you get it? Yep. You and a beer. Yep. Vermont. 18.9 gallons. New Hampshire and Vermont. They're really beer drinkers up there. They're drinking over six gallons more a year per 21-year-old adult than, Mar than Delaware's doing. I don't know. I've never been in a craft brewery up there, so I have. <laughs> anyway, second state in this region is Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is ranked fourth in the country. 25th is Maryland. You come in the middle of the pack. 31st, Virginia. And la whoop, last, West Virginia. Dead last. You're even behind D.C. <laughs> Any West Virginians in here? Yeah. Yeah. You guys, you guys got to pick up the pace. <laughs> Try harder. <laughs> all right. So what do all these craft breweries have in common? They want malted barley to make beer. It's this grow it local, buy it local, use it local movement that's been occurring. They'd like to be able to purchase locally grown malted barley. So what is the malting process? Malting is actually taking harvested grain and having a controlled germination. And during that controlled germination, you're converting some of the starch into sugar. And when I say a controlled ver germination, it's about a three to four day, it probably varies by lot as to how long they go before they stop that process. And then they rapidly, in a process they called kilning, or drying it down, they dry that malted grain down to 4% moisture. Here's a little close up of what actually happens. And with barley, if you've ever looked at a germinating barley seed, you know that the acrospire, or the shoot, which is a whole heck of a lot easier to say, grows up underneath the seed coat, right? Unlike wheat, where it germ and you see the root and the shoot outside the seed coat, in barley, you've got this seed coat that protects that shoot as it's growing. What they like to do is let it grow to about three quarters to maybe seven eighths the length of the kernel, and then they stop it. And at that point in time, they've got enough conversion of starch to sugar that uh, it will function well when it's actually in the rest of the processes up here is the fermentation process of making the beer. But the malting process is just this, this top uh, step up there from getting the grain, steeping it, germinating it, and kilning it down. All right. I already mentioned that all of them would like to purchase locally grown malting barley. One of the limitations was the fact that until recently, there were no local malt houses here. So if you were growing barley for the purpose of, of producing malt, you had to ship it to a Western malt house. I think there was possibly one in Wisconsin, Michigan, someplace like that was maybe the closest oh, one. New York. New York yeah. malt house. Okay. But you had to ship it out, which is, was costly. So. That's changed. And this is the 800 pound gorilla in the room, proximity malt. They have a demand, 1.2, or they, they, they have a capacity for 1.2 million bushel per year that they can malt in about 9,500 bushel lots is what they're doing. A Couple smaller ones, we've got Dark Cloud Malt House over in Howard County. And when I say small, these probably, this one in Amber Fields, will not malt more than, I don't think they'll malt as much as the proximity pl uh, plant will malt in one lot in a year. They're, they're, they're small, they're growing, and they're, they're hoping to meet some of the demand of the craft breweries, but uh, they're growing. Another question, who can name which malting facility came first of these three? Dark Cloud, Amber Fields, Proximity. Amber Fields, you're a winner. You're absolutely right. In fact, Amber Fields has been around uh, probably about 20 years now. The fellow over there, uh, Greg Claybaugh, is a, uh, he's, he's a dairy farmer. I met with Greg about 20 years ago when he had an interest in, 
he had this dream of growing malting barley and he wanted to malt it on his farm. He actually set up his first malting facility using a wash machine. It was that small. He's grown a little bit more since then. He's still relatively small, but, uh, uh, and he's still milking cows. His dream was he wanted to get, stop milking cows and, and go into the malting barley business, but he's still milking those cows. So, But he's getting closer, getting closer to his dream. All right, a little bit more about how big this demand for malting barley in this region could potentially be. Let's look at the amount of beer consumed, 26.4 gallons. We have approximately 21 million drinking age adults in this region, and I'm talking about this five state region, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. That means 554 million gallons of beer is consumed every year. 1.1 pounds of malted barley will make a gallon of beer, which means we need about 610 million pounds of malting barley. However, 20% of that's going to be lost in cleaning because they, they clean it uh, pretty harshly. So 762 million pounds is needed, which means 16 million bushel. At 75 bushel to the acre, to meet all the beer consumption demand in those five states, we need 213,000 acres of malt barley to be produced. Last year, in this five state region, or in 2017, I mean 100,000 acres of barley was, there's room for growth, no doubt about it. But let's just pare that down because we've got 12.7% of that uh, total malting barley consumption for craft brew. About 27,000 acres would meet the local demand in this five state region. Proximity, of course, has visions of not just here, but all up and down the, the, the East Coast. That's why they kind of strategically located themselves uh, here to, to go both sort, south and uh, north, if they possibly can. All right, so if you're going to pr uh, produce malting barley, one of the things you'd need to do is meet the specs that they have for specialty malts. And they have a lot of different kinds of malts. You've got a Pilsner, Pale Ale, They'll even do some wheat and rye at the Dark Cloud Malt House. Proximity has a whole schedule of, of malts they'll make from a crystal malt to a chocolate malt to a, a Pilsner as well, a Munich type malt. What does all that mean? Well, here's sort of a picture of those different kinds of malts. You got from light to dark. How do you think they, you get that? The roasting process, yep. You're absolutely right. The longer you roast it, the darker the malt will get, uh, which can add, in some cases, not only to the color of the beer, but also maybe some of the flavors uh, that, that are in the beer. But they also add uh, other things, hops and various other things you find in, in a lot of these craft brews. Okay, what proximity is doing for this coming year, they want growers to grow the variety Violetta, which is a two row type. They're paying $5 for malting barley delivered to their plant. They will pay next year. This last year they paid, it was either four and a quarter or 450 was what their, their price was. However, in order to do so, you do have to meet the malting barley specs that they have set up and there are a few of them. Um, one, they want high germination, 95% or better, which is accomplishable particularly in, in malting barley varieties, because one of the things they've done as they've developed malting barley varieties is they bred out all dormancy factors involved. And dormancy is that factor that once a crop, a cereal in particular, meets, uh, reaches harvest maturity, there will be an extended period where even if you're exposed to the right conditions for germinating, they won't. They'll just hold off. And they've gotten rid of that for the most part in the malting barley industry because they want uniform germination when they malt the, the, the grain. So they've eliminated that, that. That's good for them. That's not so good if you're a grower. And I'll talk more about that a little later on. Protein content, 12% maximum they want. So you have to manage your protein. And that's achievable. Nitrogen management can do a lot uh, for that along with the, the, the correct uh, variety selection. They want plump kernels. They want 85% of the kernels when they put a sample on a screen and shake it, and that screen is 664ths of an inch. 
They want 85% of those kernels to remain on the top of that screen. If you have 5% or more that go through the screen, five, the, the, the smaller screen, you get discounted. Dawn, or the vomitoxin, that's the result of a fusarium head blight infection. They can only accept about one part per million. Sometimes they'll buy at two parts per million, but it'll be at a discount. And the reason why is you don't get rid of the vomitoxin in the fermentation process. You kind of just enhance it. So it's very limited. It's like the wheat industry, you know. For flour wheat, they're only going to accept a certain amount of Dawn. Now, of course, they'll play the same games as, as the wheat industry. They will blend. If they have some that's a 2% that, and they have some that's lower, they'll, they'll, they'll just blend to get what they want. But they, they try to keep it at one part per million or less. Uh, damaged kernels. They don't want any skinned kernels. So the secret to producing sound barley, which they also include as a, a spec, is be gentle when you're harvesting the crop. Don't beat the crap out of it, as I know some folks like to do because they don't like beards on barley. And man, if you turn that combiner, combine cylinder speed up, you'll get rid of it. They don't, they don't want that. You have to be gentle. Uh, that's about it, I guess, as far as specs. All right. It kind of ends the whole demand scenario that we we're going to talk about. We're now going to go into those best management practices for achieving uh, the specs for the industry. Another question for a beer. What is the variety of malt barley proximity is contracting for in 2019? Violetta. Violetta. Okay. If you were first, remember and come get your beer at the end of the presentation. It's an honor system here, folks. There's only six beers, so. <laughs> All right, since we're talking about variety, variety selection really is key with any crop you're producing. It's the same uh, for malting barley. It's kind of limited if you're going for proximity at this point in time, Violet is the variety they want. Will uh, Violetta continue to be that variety? Probably not. We all know that a variety can be popular for a while and it's growing quite a bit and the next thing you know that wonderful disease package that it had isn't so wonderful anymore. <coughs> you start seeing some uh, disease show up. So a new variety will come along. I think the next variety will be Calypso. I can't say that for sure for proximity. I know we've looked at Calypso and there's been some malting barley uh, growers over on the other side of the bay that have grown some clips. So it does very well. It, it's comparable uh, to Violet, or maybe just a little bit later, uh, but otherwise it, it's very similar. Thoroughbred, I listed thoroughbred up there, not simply because thoroughbred, for comparison purposes, it's a, a well known feed barley, been around for probably 25 years already. Very good variety does very well. It's also a reasonable malting barley. And the reason is one of the parents of thoroughbred was a malting barley variety from France. So that's why thoroughbred has, uh, has good malting qualities. What I'm told by malsters is that thoroughbred makes a good base malt, but not so much for some of the other kind of specialty malts, but they'll use thoroughbred as, as sort of a, a base malt uh, source. Charles, I listed that one down here. Nothing remarkable about Charles, 65 bushel to the acre. It's an early variety. Um, the reason I listed Charles is because this was or is the first winter malting barley that was developed in the United States. It's a two row variety. And in fact, back in the, I guess it was about the mid nineties, uh, I was doing some work with malting barley, got in touch with the breeder out at Aberdeen, Idaho, the USDA facility in Aberdeen, Idaho. And uh, one thing led to another and I started testing some of the breeding lines he had under development. And at that point in time, this was an AB 1265 something or other. Uh, and, and we looked at it uh, in this region and lo and behold, it ended up becoming the, the first released uh, two row winter malting barley in the US. Now there's been Winter malting barley is developed in Europe as well, so don't think it's the first one that's out there, but it's the first one that was developed in the, the U.S. All right, 
Field selection is important. And in fact, I recommend that you avoid planting after corn if possible, primarily because you want to avoid uh, fusarium head blight. And if you're planting behind corn, corn is a host. It's in the corn stalks and you stand a really good opportunity for infection if everything else falls into place. Everything else meaning the right weather conditions uh, for a fusarium infection. Uh, planting behind full, soy, full season soybean, great. Some vegetable crops I'm sure that can come off in a timely manner. You want to plant late September, early part of October, just like field barley, feed barley, okay? Seeding grade, and I recommend, just as I do for any of the cereals, go for a seedlings per acre. Start there and work your way towards your seeding rate. Don't go to the back of the drill, lift up, look at the table that's on the side, got barley and wheat and oats and all those crops, and you go across and it says, uh, barley two and a half bushel of the acre. Okay, well, I'm gonna throw in X number of units to meet that, and, and then go out and plant it. You don't wanna do that. If you're growing two row barleys, seed size is larger. You wanna pay attention to that, particularly if you're going for seedlings per uh, acre. You wanna pay attention to the germination rate. And most of them are greater than 90% and they're probably up there around that 95%. Then calculate, if you want one and a half million is your goal of emerged seedlings, divide by the germination rate to find out how many seeds you need to put out there to actually get that many seedlings to establish themselves. You can end up, by going through all of this process, you can end up putting out 150, 200 uh, pounds of the acre in order to accomplish uh, the seeding rate that you want. Now, if you've gone through all that effort, don't stop there. Make sure you calibrate your drill so that you're actually planting the amount that you want out there so that you can establish what you set out with up there. Okay, soil fertility, do a soil test. You wanna keep your pH six and a half to seven. Adjust for soil P and K, keep them in the optimum range. Pay attention to sulfur. Malding barley, like all other crops, if you have a sulfur deficiency, it's going to impact your production. As far as nitrogen management, you want to, you want to pay attention to nitrogen management because it's going to influence your protein content. A couple of the four R management steps, timing and rate, pretty critical here. Timing, use fall in if you need it. In Maryland, we have a false soil nitrate test that will tell you how much residual nitrate you have after you've harvested your previous crop. For barley, if it's less than or equal to 15 parts per million, some fall in may be warranted. You can apply up to 30 pounds in the fall to help get that crop started. And believe me, folks, this past year, if there's any false soil nitrate tests that have above 10 parts per million, I'd be surprised. I'll bet they're low. Anybody do any of those this fall? I mean, there's not a whole head of What'd you find? Low. low? Detectable low, or was it so low that? It's detectable, <laughs> De mostly five to eight. Five to eight, yeah, not surprising given the year that we've had, so. Manure, I don't recommend using it if you're going to produce malting barley. Primarily because you're gonna put that manure out in the fall and Following spring, at the point in time that you're in grain fill, that manure is gonna be mineralizing and supplying additional nitrogen, which is going to influence your protein content. Stay away from it. You wanna stay below 12% protein. As far as spring nitrogen, first application at green up, whenever green up is, during that late tillering phase, late winter, early spring tillering phase. Some in Maryland, I know, March 1 is typically the date, but some years they allow 15th of February. Pay attention to that, put that first application out. Come in with the second application, and this is really the more critical one, when that first node appears above the soil surface at that beginning stage of jointing. And why? Because, yeah, because you don't, again, want to have too much nitrogen on out there late that's going to impact your protein. All right, 
some nitrogen work that did a couple years ago. Look, both heavier soils, sandy soils, uh, had a range of rates that we looked at and what we found was that about 85 pounds of nitrogen, spring nitrogen, not counting what was used in the fall, the spring nitrogen, we got our economic optimum, which is the one that was the most profitable. Agronomic optimum was a little bit higher, about 105 pounds. Uh, agronomic optimum is that end rate that no longer gives you a, a, a yield benefit. Uh, but heavier soils, about 80 pounds in the spring. You got lighter soils, a little bit more, up to 100 pounds. We'll probably do it. About 60% of that should go on at the first application and 40% the second application. Again, trying to make sure that you don't impact that protein content. All right, and what did our particular study, what did it do to the protein here at our 75 and 100 pound rates? We did get up uh, 10 and a half, almost 11% protein with 100 pounds of nitrogen. With 75 pounds, you can see we had less, but we kept it under that 12%. That be vigilant in regards to weed management. Select fields that have a history of little or no weed problems. Think of it as growing a seed crop. You kind of want to produce mulling barley the same way. You wouldn't choose a weedy field for seed production purposes. So do the same thing with mulling barley. Avoid fields with a history of grassy weed species. They're going to be really a bugger to try to control uh, in, in a cereal crop. Fall burn down if you need it. Manage your broadleaf weeds in the spring with the, the approved herbicides for that. Uh, do pay attention. Sometimes you'll, you'll find a herbicide that isn't okay uh, for barley and it might be for wheat. So do pay attention to the label. As far as insects are concerned, again, monitor your crop. Know what's going on out there. This is a high value crop. You want to protect it. So be out there. Check what's going on. In the fall in particular, watch for aphids because of the development of barley yellow dwarf that can, that's associated with aphids. Cereal leaf beetle, armyworm, cutworms. As far as disease management, <coughs> variety resistance, of course, is the most economical approach to take. And I already talked some about that that resistance changes over time. So these varieties are going to also change as uh, the, the, the resistance packages break down and the, the accepted varieties and you have new varieties that are coming along. Monitor for the fall aphid infestation, as I mentioned earlier. In the spring, be prepared, be prepared to use a foliar fungicide. Diseases like powdery mildew, leaf rust, net blotch, spot blotch, scald, all diseases that you're watching for in, in your field barley uh, or feed barley, um, these malting barley varieties are going to be susceptible to as well. Uh, just the last, you want to be watching for any of these diseases, particularly as that crop gets to that with a flag leaf is forming. You don't want to get disease on that flag leaf because again, that is the leaf that contributes the most to your yield potential. Fusarium head blight is definitely one that, that you want to be monitoring for. It happens in this region. It happens in wheat a lot. and barley, we don't hear about it so much. Part of the reason is for feed barley production. We probably didn't pay that much attention because the tolerance levels for most livestock is, is greater than a one part per million tolerance level that the uh, malting industry has. What you would be looking for is after the, the uh, grain or the, the, the crop is headed out, about two, three weeks later, you start looking for those dead kernels that you have in the heads, just like you do for wheat, same sort of uh, thing. All right, one easy way to know whether you need to take action is monitor this site right here. How many of you do that for wheat? The, head scab, the wheat scab report. So you can make a decision about putting out fungicide. Yeah, nobody, okay. Well, anyway, this is the site. That's the URL to get there. What it does on a daily basis is it gives a prediction of what the risk is for scab formation in the region. This last May, on May 1, a little bit on the eastern shore of Virginia is all that was there. By May 12th, things hadn't changed much, but it had moved up pretty much the, the entire east coast of, of the eastern shore. We had a little bit of risk. On May 17th, five days later, this was what happened. Monitoring is important because 
this thing can explode. It explodes overnight. Why? Rain. Rain events. The other piece that's important as far as infection is pollination stage for the grain. That's what you watch for in wheat, right? For scab infection? Yes, no, don't really give a damn. Will you hurry up and get done and shut up and I can get out of here? It's about lunchtime. Okay, we'll move on. <laughs> All right, a couple years ago we looked at use of a protective fungicide. Procero was one of the fungicides that was available. Another one was Corumba. Provides you scab protection or at least um, limiting the amount of the vomitoxin that will occur. Three varieties that we looked at, yes, fungicide, no, is the red bars, yes, used a fungicide, and we had reductions in the amount of Dawn in the grain for all three varieties, and all varieties are going to be susceptible. Here's where planting behind soybeans really makes sense. At one location, we planted behind soybean, we had little Dawn formation. The green line is the one part per million. We had two parts per million at the Y where we went into corn stalks. All varieties showed a similar amount of, of uh, Dawn. And remember, this is what they want. This, you're gonna see deductions. All right, this last year, a new product became available. Now labeled Moravis Ace. How many of you have heard of Moravis Ace? Okay, good. And the benefit of Moravis Ace is that it's got a link, longer window of application or protection. For wheat, it's really being promoted for wheat. I think it's got a place here with, with malting barley. What we looked at was four different treatments, had a control with no fungicide. We put Moravis Ace out when the tips of the awns were appearing at the flag leaf level. They were just starting to show. That was our first treatment date. The next treatment date we had was when those heads were about 50% extended above the flag leaf. Half was below, half the head below the flag leaf, half above. We also put Prosaro out. We were comparing the two, two products at that same time. It, this amounted to about five days difference between that first treatment tip-ons and when we put our second treatment out with the other two products. All right, about three weeks after we put the treatments out, uh, Dr. Nidhi Rawat, the pathologist at the University of Maryland, rated the plots for index. In our control, she gave an index rating, and what index tells us is the how much by how bad. So it looked like we had a pretty significant infection at the two locations. Got an index rating of about 50. With the Moravis, when those ons were just appearing, we got a, about a 50% reduction. When we sprayed a little bit later, five days later, we got even a little bit more reduction. The Prasara was similar to the Moravis uh, at the earlier application date. What did this do for Dawn? Well, at the Y, we actually got enough Dawn to be greater than the one part per million with the Moravis early, which tells us when those ons are just showing, it's a little too early. Come out a little bit later to put that Moravis on, and we got a real good response with it at that date. Prosaro also reduced uh, the amount, but not quite as good as what we saw with, with the Moravis Ace uh, when those heads are about 50% extended. At our other location, we had no differences whatsoever. I have no idea why. We had, th th there was scab there, we saw it but it just had no effect. So, and that's, that's the thing about this animal. You, you just never know what the response is gonna be. Proximity has not rejected a load this year, given how bad it was. They haven't rejected a load for too high a dawn levels. I think the reason is the barley was at that susceptible stage earlier than when the potential for the disease. When you're was talking clean. about 50% of the heads, is that 50% of the heads emerged or 50% emerged above the flag leaf? 50% of the heads about halfway out of the flag leaf. Out of the flag leaf. 
is when we did it. Yeah, and of course, you still got some that are, you, you, if you've looked at a field that's heading, they, they, they do it over a period of time. That was about 50% of the heads in the field that were at that stage is what we were shooting for. So, yeah. 50% head emergence, complete, complete head emergence is on the label? And 50% head emergence on all emergence is not on the label. Okay, yep, yep. All right, as far as yield response, we didn't get a significant amount of yield bump. Usually you like to see your number here, your probability value at 0.05 or less, but we did see a consistent about a five to seven bushel yield increase, no matter what uh, fungicide treatment we used we got been compared to the control over here all right harvest the crop when it's ready be gentle don't skin up those kernels because you want to knock those on in fact when we were producing malding barley back in montana they told us cut that cylinder speed down to the point where you have ons that are that long on the kernels being brought in that's what they wanted so you don't need to knock those ons off. You don't want to skin those kernels. You turn that cylinder speed down and, and be really gentle. You want to get it when it's mature because it will easily germinate. We used to say that, man, if it smelled water, it would germinate. <laughs> and they sometimes would reject it. You'd get a light shower on the crop. And they were very uh, cognizant of color change. They wanted bright white malting barley and sometimes you'd get a rain and you know how barley can discolor and become more yellow and turn yellow a little bit. They didn't want it. They rejected it. So the craft um, molsters here, not quite that particular. So can we grow it here? Yeah, I think so. $5 is going to, makes it interesting. There's gonna be folks that are gonna try. Proximity wants 8,000 acres this year. I don't know whether they got it or not they could use 16,000 acres uh, to meet their, their annual production. All right, with that, I thank you for your attention, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Uh, they've got some local production. They had this last year. They were contracted, so they're bringing that in. Whatever else they need, they're bringing it in from out west. They have two plants, one in Lowell, Delaware, and one in Colorado. So. They've got access to good stuff if they need it. <laughs> so, anybody else? Don't forget your beers if you were a winner. You get your beer. Yeah. Jason. Quick question. Um, if a farmer had to plant into corn stubble, he just had no beans, <clears throat> bean ground available, uh, does tillage of that uh, field help break down the inoculum source? Question is, if you have to plant into corn, stocks if tillage would help um, I think how it would help is if you could bury it nobody's moldboard plowing but uh, otherwise that just tillage itself isn't going to break down the you've locked yourself the disease the fungicide in the spring you have oh yeah 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 we have if you have, if you're got it on yeah well and we have fusarium outbreaks frequently enough that it's a problem here you you, you need to be prepared to spray yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you, you need to. Any other questions? Thank you all. Appreciate it.